O God, open our minds and attune our hearts to the reading of these words. Breathe your spirit upon them and upon us as we listen, that they may be words of life for us all. Amen. Scripture this morning is from John chapter 11. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were, there, who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So, Jew, so the Jews said, see how he loved him? May God bless this reading. Amen.
Good morning. The title of our topic today is Held in God as We Hold Our Grief. And I would like to start today with a story from the book The Wisdom Jesus by Cynthia Bourgeau about the student, the master, and the overflowing cup. A young speaker, keen to become the student of a certain master, invited, is invited to an interview at the master's house. The student rambles on about all his spiritual experience, his past teachers, his insight and skills, his pet philosophies. The master listens silently and begins to pour a cup of tea. He pours and pours, and eventually, when the cup is overflowing, he keeps right on pouring. Eventually, the student notices what's going on and interrupts his monologue to say, stop pouring, your cup is full. The teacher says, yes, and so are you. How can I possibly teach you? I, I think that's how life is for me sometimes. I get so busy with the details of life and the chatter of my thoughts that I often forget to listen and find my own quiet center where I can just take a moment and connect with God. I'm, I'm not a journal person, nor am I a meditator. And um, when I meditate, actually, I love it. But somehow, it's not one of those things I naturally uh, prioritize in my life. And even though those are both great tools for many people use to find their quiet center and clear out all that chatter and noise, I, I just I forget about that. Grief has a way of getting our attention, of bringing us to that place, even if involuntarily. When events happen that command our attention in these moments, everything else just falls away. Being with my mother during her transition from life was one of the most sacred and profound moments of my life. Other things that before seemed important or pressing or urgent just faded into the distant background during that time, and I found myself just being present with her and my mother during those holy moments. Most of you here know that Nick and I adopted our daughter, Maddie, there she is. We were foster parents, and we were on a list to adopt a baby. One day, we received a call from social services letting us know there was an infant who had just been released from the NICU, and um, she had been abandoned in the hospital by an unstable birth mother and was needing a foster adoption placement. Would we be interested? We hopped in the van and went to meet her, she weighed five pounds. She fit from here to here. She was the tiniest little thing. And the first time I held her, she just fused to my heart. And I knew she was mine. And I just, at that moment, I just loved her with everything I had. They handed me a small stack of diapers and the extra onesie. I said, do you have a car seat? So of course, we didn't have a car seat, so Nick hopped in the car and ran down to the Kmart at the end of the street and bought every single thing in Kmart that was tiny and pink <laughs> and a car seat Then came back, and we brought home a baby. Um, our kids would later joke that we went out for groceries and came home with a, a baby. <laughs> the social worker told us that due to the circumstances of the birth mother's story, this would be a straightforward slam dunk adoption. But as many adoption stories go, this turned sideways. To make a long story short, Maddie was reunited with her birth mother only to be placed back again with us six months later. And normally due to um, Maddie's age, at this point, services would have been terminated for the birth mother um, and she would have been placed up for adoption. However, the judge, against the recommendation of social services, ruled to allow another reunification with birth mom following an 18-month placement with us. And we were completely devastated. At this point, 
we turned to our faith community for support. We were attending St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Santa Inez. Our minister, Father Stacy, was a former social worker and suggested that we apply for de facto parent status for Madeline. We had a letter writing party after church that day, or one day, and our congregation wrote us 23 letters of recommendation to be Maddie's de facto parents, which our judge was required personally to read, every one of them. And the next hearing, he granted us de facto parent status, which legally made us Maddie's next of kin. And as such, that gave us standing in court, which was very important for our process. On the advice of our social worker and Santa Barbara Social Services, we retained an attorney, and he informed us that as her legal next of kin, we had the right to invoke a procedural process that would contest the judge's ruling and have the case heard in a trial before a three-judge panel. So that was, that was the plan. We had a process we were going to follow. And on the final day of the final hearing, the judge ruled for reunification, and our attorney stood up and announced that we wished to contest the ruling and try the judge before the three-judge panel. And the judge said, denied. At which point, my attorney stood up and said, Your Honor, you can't deny this. It's the law. He actually held up the book and said, It's the law. It's a statute right here. And the judge said, right out of a bad Perry Mason episode, In my court, I am the law, sir. Sit down or you will be held in contempt. So the social worker stood up the other, on the other side and said, Oh, this works out just great because the Lawrences have Maddie right here in court. We can just take her now. And that is when time stopped. And that is when they took my baby. And I can still hear her crying and calling for me and seeing her. They picked her up and carried her down the hallway with and she was her little arms crying, Mommy and Muti. In that moment, my entire life just crumbled. In that moment, there was no tomorrow. There's no what was happening at work, nothing. There was nothing else in that moment but heartbreak. The world had fallen away, and there was only grief and only pain, and it was truly the worst day of my life. The days that followed were a blur. I was unable to get out of bed. I felt as if it would always be this way, and the hurt would just live in me forever. But again, my faith community stepped in to help, coming to my house, asking for ways to support me, sitting on the couch with me while I cried. They asked me what I needed after a while, and I said, I just need to get out of the house. And they found me a job, <laughs> recommended me. It was a great job. And slowly, eventually, the world started coming back into focus. Each day, I was able to take one step back and reintegrate into this crazy, noisy world. When I was preparing this talk, um, I was working with Nancy Wilson, and we, she told me a story about when she had to speak um, at the funeral of a young child. And after the service, she spoke with the mother, and she told her that she thought that even though there was a huge hole in her heart, and that hole would be there forever, it would get easier. Every day it would get a little easier. And that hole would be a place that love and healing for others could flow from. And I have, to, I have to think that that's what happened for me. I believe that God gives us the ability and the impulse for healing. I think it's our nature to move toward the light. When I joined the Changemaker group last year, we were asked to find a way that we could make positive change in the world. 
I had no idea what gift I could possibly bring. In fact, I was, I was really stumped. And this summer, I took a course um, in a modality called Emotional Freedom Technique. And um, I'm training to become a practitioner in this modality. And through this process, I realized that one of my gifts is my ability to hold a space for profound grief for my clients. And I can truly be able to tell them in all confidence that it will get better. They will heal. And God will never abandon them, just as God never abandoned me. So I'd like to close with a little gift from my new training modality. EFT works on our acupuncture meridians. So imagine there's all these little lines running around our bodies. So imagine if you're in the BART station and you're looking at all of the routes and at the Embarcadero, they all come together. So the meridians do the same thing in our bodies and one of the places where they all come together is on our wrists. So we can tap here on our wrists, and I invite you to do that. It's very calming. Imagine, imagine some patting a baby or patting a little old lady, <laughs> me, <laughs> patting someone on the hand and saying, it's all right, dear. And <laughs> nervous systems don't often respond to words. But this is the language of the nervous system. And so this is telling our nervous systems, it's OK. Everything's going to be OK. Thank you very much. Amen. In our scripture this morning, we find Jesus approaching the village of Bethany, having just received word that his beloved friend Lazarus has died. And at one point, the dead man's sister, Mary, runs out to Jesus, kneels at his feet and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus moved by Mary's weeping as well as by the grief of the other villagers, is greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved, whereupon he too begins to weep. And one thing I noticed about this passage that I have never noticed in all the many, many times I have heard it, read it, wrestled with it, is that Jesus will later go out to the tomb of Lazarus, where again he will be greatly disturbed. But it strikes me that it is here in our passage from this morning that Jesus' grief seems to be less about the death of Lazarus and more about the grief of the sisters and the villagers. Here, outside the village, and before even approaching the tomb, Jesus is holding not only his own sorrow, but holding the raw heartache of others as well. And this, I believe, is what moves him to tears. I want to say what privilege it's been for me to work with Donna for the past month or so um, in shaping this service and as we've shared some of not only our thoughts and ideas about grief but some of our own experiences as well. And I so deeply honor Donna's journey through grief and how she and I dare say, Nick, alongside her, have walked that path with 
courageously open hearts and how that journey continues to unfold as Donna discovers how what begins as a gaping wound can over time be transformed into a source of healing and compassion in the world. One of my favorite authors, Mirabai Starr, I heard her speak this past week about the fragrance of the sacred that permeates a broken heart. The fragrance of the sacred that permeates a broken heart. That isn't, I don't think, a given. A broken heart, if not tended with love and care, and if not yielded into the divine mercy of God in which we are held, can just end up being a broken heart. And it can lead sometimes to bitterness, and sometimes to brittleness, and there's a difference between breaking and breaking open. If we allow grief to break us open, there, I believe, is where we will begin to detect that fragrance of the sacred in the broken heart. My antennae have been particularly attuned to grief and loss lately, not just because today is Donna's and my turn in the shoot, and this is our particular topic, but also because this past Thursday marked the 34th anniversary of the death of my first husband, Jack. And Donna spoke of the friends who sat on her couch and held her as she cried, and this past week I've been remembering my own very dear couch sitters, in particular, Carolyn and Beth. They showed up on my doorstep the day after Jack's death. They didn't wrestle with finding the perfect words that would soothe me. They brought no lasagna nor chocolate cake, although <laughs> those would have been unwelcome. But they just brought the most perfect gift, the gift of themselves, to just sit on my couch for the whole afternoon, to be with me, to hold the grief, to hold the space of grieving, much like Jesus outside the village of Bethany. I have thought often of them and that day and the sheer holiness of that afternoon, Carolyn and Beth showed up, and in the air was the fragrance of the sacred. At this time, I would invite you, if you feel so inclined, to bring into your mind and heart a significant loss in your own life. Perhaps that is a recent loss perhaps not, and just hold that, remembering that you are here held in this community and that we are all here held in the heart of God. And as you hold that loss, as you bring it into your heart, reflect on who showed up for you? Who was community for you? Who held your grief? And who might have even wept with you? And then, again, if you feel so moved, I would invite you to come forward 
There are little candles on the round table. And if you would like to take one of those candles and light it by turning on the little switch on the bottom of the candle, <laughs> to light your candle and place it here on the altar to remember, to remember your loss, to honor that loss. And if you're in a place where you can even give thanks for that loss, if that's something you can do honestly, that might be something you could do. And to remember and honor as well those who were community and perhaps still are community for you in your loss. Whatever is meaningful for you at, at this time, you're invited to come and light a candle.